Hello and welcome to you all. Um, my name is Paula McLaughlin. I'm co-founder, uh, chair and acting CEO of A Lust for Life. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with us, we are a mental health charity um, that uses content campaigns and events to facilitate young people to be better guardians of their own minds. Um, I could say an awful lot more about what we do, but I'm not going to because that's not what we're here uh, to talk about. Uh, do, of course, check us out on alustforlife.com. Drop us a line if you'd like to hear more. But what we are here to talk about uh, is hope. Um, now, like all things Irish, uh, tonight came from the chats. Um, the rest of us at A Lust for Life have been having the chats over the last number of weeks, and they were probably the kind of chats that we have all been having probably since Christmas on a daily basis and are probably happening in most living rooms across Ireland uh, as we speak. So not, not going to be unfamiliar to you in response to the how are you doing? We were getting and we were given the I won't lie, I'm struggling. Um, we were hearing I'm feeling a bit shite actually. Uh, I'm really struggling with this one. This one's definitely the hardest was something I've been hearing an awful lot. And I'm finding it really hard to motivate myself and I just feel a bit blah, have been the kind of conversations that, that we've been having. Being honest, we started to bore ourselves with those chats after a while and we quickly started to talk about hope, uh, why we need hope uh, and the impact that hope has on your mental health. And we also started to talk about what we were individually looking forward to as something to hold on to. So I don't mind sharing with you our wonderful director, Kira O'Connor. Uh, the thing that she's holding on to is sitting in the George Bar in Dublin city centre with her two best friends, with no kids, bedecked in jewels and hugging every random punter that walks into the bar. Um, I personally am holding on to a plan I have that I'm going to get into a, a, a ball gown, high heel shoes and possibly even a tiara and I'm going down to Rings End Dump uh, with the tracksuit bottoms, the grand comfortable tops that I've been living in for the last year. And if I can find an incinerator, all the better. Um, the point is that we're, we are all trying and struggling to hold on to something, uh, something that gives us hope and we all need hope. And I think that seems to be a fairly universal uh, feeling right now. So we decided to launch a campaign called Hunt for Hope um, to ask people to share where they're finding it. So it's a really simple concept. Just share the real truth about what you're holding on to that's giving you a glimmer of hope and um, a glimmer of light. So we're not talking about fridge magnet philosophy. We're not talking about sharing inspirational quotes. If life gives you lemons, make lemonade. We're not talking about inspirational stories of I did three workouts with Joe Wicks today. We're talking about the honest truth about what's keeping you going. So it could be the first hug you're going to have with your granny. It could be an amazing walk you found within your 5K um, that's just become your new happy place. Or it could be the first time you hear that bloody awful Ryanair trumpet mm -hmm. telling you that your flight to Ibiza has landed on time. Mm -hmm. So it's a really simple concept to share your hopes. The quirkier, the funnier, the better, because God knows we could all do with a laugh right now. Um, all we're asking is stick your thoughts up on social media. Uh, tag us with the hashtag, um, hashtag Hunt for Hope, um, or you can email us on info at alustforlife.com and we'll share it uh, for you. Um, it really is that simple. It might just help you. It might just help someone else. Um, now, we couldn't think of a better way to launch this campaign than to have a chat about the psychology and the science of hope and also the hope that we can find in the science and in our own psychology. Um, why do we need it? How does it work? Where can we find it? And that brings us to our two wonderful guests um, who you can hopefully see on screen there. Um, it really is a privilege to have both of you uh, here with us. And the best compliment I can probably give you is that this evening started out as a very intimate affair with 100 people. And um, we actually now have 1,153 devices logged into the call, which means there's about two and a half thousand people tuned in. 
and I know they're not here to listen to me. So I'll get started by introducing you both, if that's okay. Um, so Professor Luke O'Neill is a world-renowned immunologist and in 2016 was made a Fellow of the Royal Society for his work on the human immune system. He is currently Professor of Biochemistry in the School of Biochemistry in, and Immunology in Trinity College, Dublin. His books include Humanology, The Great Irish Science Book for Children, and most recently, the award-winning Never Mind the Bollocks, Here's the Science. Great title. He is also the lead singer of an aptly named band called the Metabolics, who have a mission to prove that rock, pop, and funk are the best medicine. And according to their Facebook page, if you want to check it out, this band is made up of doctors and scientists, um, and they will provide covers for all ailments, which is... Uh, very, very uh, applaudable. Professor Ian Robertson is a clinical psychologist and neuroscientist and widely recognized as one of the world's leading researchers in neuropsychology. Um, he is co-director of the, Glo the Global Brain Health Institute and emeritus professor at Trinity College Dublin. His books include uh, the forthcoming book, which I believe is coming out in June, Ian. Yeah. Um, called How Confidence Works, The New Science of Self-Belief and Why Some People Learn It and Others Don't. His last best-selling book was The Stress Test, How Pressure Can Make You Stronger and Sharper. And previous books include Mind Sculpture, The Mind's Eye and The Winner Effect. Ian is not currently the lead singer of the band, to the best of our knowledge. But should he decide to be, we've come up with a great name for one for you, uh, Ian. And we really think that a sing-off between the metabolics and the psychedelics would be an absolute <laughs> sellout gig. And it would give a serious hope. So I'm going to leave it with you both to work that out between you. Okay? Um, so we'll get started. And um, we're going to have some questions from the audience a little bit later on. But I wanted to start by asking you both the same question. Um, We've seen a, a lot of both of you uh, in the media during the pandemic, um, and you've brought a great deal of wisdom, advice, calm, positivity, and hope to an awful lot of people. And not only are we grateful for you here being here this evening, but I think as a country, we're very grateful for that. When everyone is looking to you both as experts uh, for answers and for hope, how are you maintaining your own personal hope as people and not as experts or scientists. And I'll start with you, Ian, if that's okay. For me, it's, it, it's the, the relationships I have. I'm just very lucky to be living with a wonderful family, multi-generation family. And that's just, you realize when the, all the busyness of external life is taken away from you, all the ridiculous amount of travel I was doing, the holidays, all the busyness. And suddenly all you have really is your relationships and yes, your work, but you're sitting at home. And you realize that what really matters in life is people and small pleasures. Mm. And really, uh, and, and, and feeling, uh, and third thing, feeling a sense of purpose or meaning, yeah. which I get from my work. And if you have these three, you realize all the rest is froth. Yeah. In fact, a lot of the time, all the rest of these things um, can subtract from you really appreciating if you're lucky enough to have them. And I don't underestimate mm. because a lot of other people are not fortunate like I am. So what gives me hope is the fact that actually human needs are reasonably simple. Mm. And that if we organize ourselves properly, we can fulfill it for most people, if not for everyone. And that gives me enormous hope. Mm. And then there's a the whole science side of things we'll talk about again, because we'll come, we will come back come to, that. to that. Yeah, we will come back. Don't forget to add forming the psychedelics to your, to your <laughs> to spell, of course. <laughs> We're definitely onto a winner there, Ian. I know we are. Luke, how about you? Where are you getting your personal hope from? Well, as long as Ian doesn't start taking psychedelics tonight, we'll be all right, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> you never know. Who are well, we, we, we should, 
Ian, you should come and guest with the metabolics. I heard Ian, I've heard Ian sing, you know, he's got a, we were at a party in uh, Kingston Mills' house, and Kingston's another yeah. name people might know, and I think it was Kingston's 60th, maybe, and Ian sang a couple of great songs. He's got a great voice. Oh, you never yeah, know. Right, okay. I knew, I'm I, coming. knew, I knew we were on to Book something. Book me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I knew we were onto something. Yeah, well, music gives me hope, actually. If you want to start with that one, for instance, I mean, what yeah. me, me, music and science, as people probably know by now, are my two big things. And good God, you can't be getting lost in a bit of music. And and I'm in the kitchen sometimes on a dreary, yet another dreary Saturday with nothing going on, as we're all experiencing, you know. And a song comes on the radio, and I literally a tear will well in my eye because. That song strikes an emotional chord yeah. with me, you know. Yeah. Another good example recently is um, the Joe Biden inauguration and uh, oh, wow. John, John yeah. Bon Jovi sang Here Comes the Sun. I yeah. wept. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, yeah. what I'd love to happen now is, not now, in, whenever it's possible, let's have a big concert, for God's sake. Yeah. And let's get all the bands up there. And, and, and in fact, there's talk of this already. Paul, you know, um, an MEP in Brussels said, when we pick a day when this is over, which will come, by the way, Let's have like the E Day equivalent type thing in Europe, you know, where yeah. there should be two huge concerts like Live Aid. It'll raise money for the people who've lost lots of livelihoods and all the rest of it, yeah. you know. And then every every country could have its own concert. And wouldn't that be fantastic? Can you imagine the set list we'd pick? It will be songs like Here Comes the Sun. Or, Here Comes the Sun, I, absolutely. I, well, I'm kind of got my playlist going in my mind in a way. There'd be songs <laughs> of hope and like music. Is great for hope, remember. There's some fantastic, like Here Comes the Sun is the one I just said it several yeah. times, but there's a great song. I've got into a band called Elbow in the past year, you know? Oh, and yeah. they've got some fantastically they are. They're amazing, yeah. songs. Like, you know, one is called Open Arms. I love that one, for instance. You know, One Day Like This. I mean, throw those curtains wide. One day like this a year will see me right as the chorus, you know. So, so for me, <laughs> music is a big one. Um, but the, that, that's, that's I'm, not, I'm too busy, though, to listen to that music. My, science is my hope, of course. And, and when this began, I knew we'd beat it scientifically. I had full 100% faith in science. I knew what was going on in the companies because I do lots of work with companies over the years. I knew all the immunologists, all their labs. I'm very plugged into the world of immunology, obviously. And then my own lab, we began, we've got four projects now working on COVID-19. Now there's a purpose, is the word Ian used. Yeah. Every day I'm going in there to try and help them. And we made a big discovery two weeks ago. And if that panned out, wouldn't that be tremendous? We've made a discovery to do a coagulation. So this, this disease is a... As we may know, it's a coagulopathy. You get clots form in your lungs. You know? So mm -hmm. that's great because, because now you're actually working. And in fact, we, my lab reopened in April because we're working on COVID. We were given permission to go back in, you know. Mm -hmm. The joy on the students' faces to be coming back in, the PhD mm -hmm. students, mm -hmm. because they really wanted to work on this disease. The, 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 the word purpose again. I mean, they were absolutely overjoyed. And then um, we're trying to still teach our students, remember, and, and it's very difficult. A lot of it's online. But well, we've had a few face-to-face -face tutorials with the fourth-year immunology students, the you know, final year. And I set them the topic in December, you know, COVID-19, right? And they all came in and they gave a little, it was socially distanced, I hasten to add, uh, mask wearing, <laughs> good ventilation. Uh, they gave a 15-minute spiel. And one of them said to me, uh, she told her grandmother, who burst into tears, that her, her granddaughter was talking about COVID-19 scientifically, you know. Wow. So those, those kinds of things that absolutely keep me going. But having said that, and we and we would all agree, we all have our bad days. I'm sure Ian does as well. Yeah. And I wake up some mornings going, oh, Jesus, you know. Yeah. And you got to get up and get going again. Yeah. Haven't you? I mean, yeah. it, it, it's tough. And, and, and this what gets me most of all at the moment is. We have a good five, six, seven weeks ahead of us now, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it is Groundhog Day and it's going to be really tough. And I think, as you were saying earlier, Paul, people are suffering. I mean, it's a really hard time, let's face it. I mean, mm -hmm. and it's going to go on. And mm -hmm. all you can do is, as, as you were saying earlier, think about the future, because yeah. because that's the only way to cope. Well, apart from the various things we're discussing, if you can say, look, by June, July, August, this there's a good chance of this happening. And mm. I do that from a scientific point of view. People just focus on that. Say mm. to yourself, if you wake up on a gloomy Tuesday morning, worrying and, and you're, you're, you've got a, a grandmother who's stuck in a nursing, whatever the issues are, just remind yourself, we will get out of this. Science will beat this. Mm. And by the time we get to June, July, it will be a different picture. We mightn't be fully out of it. We mightn't be clear of it, but it'll certainly be different in June, July, August, that kind of time frame, you know. Mm. And just say that to yourself and then that'll get you up out of bed. Maybe have a cup of tea and off you go kind of thing. And, and can we talk about that for a minute? Because I was going to start off by talking about the impact that the pandemic is having on, on people's minds at the minute. And, and there does seem to be, 
Um, somebody's just chatted in there to ask, does that mean the electric picnic will be going ahead? So you heard it here first. Luke <laughs> told you the electric picnic is going ahead. Um, I, I wouldn't be sure of that one now. I don't think so. Yeah. But, um, um, you're obviously both seeing a lot of, of the impact that this is having on people's minds. And, you know, purpose, Ian, I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's such an, you know, an incredibly important thing. But people are struggling to find the motivation they know they should be, you know, striving to something that will help them, even if it's just a walk. And um, but some of the feedback that we had before this session is, I'm, I'm struggling to find the motivation, yeah, uh, to 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 do that. And actually, I know you've written a lot about stress, so I specifically ask ask you about this scene. A lot of people are managing an awful lot of stress because of the circumstances yeah. they have at home. They might be dealing with a child with special needs. Yeah, they might have four grumpy teenagers who don't want to be there at home. They might have vulnerable people. There, there are a wide range of circumstances. You don't need me to tell them. So what would you say based on, on what you're seeing around navigating that and reigniting a level of purpose and motivation to go through those next six or seven weeks that Luke's just spoken about? So it's a great question, Paul. And, and you know, I there's a lot of people who are doing just fine, privileged yeah. people like me, there's a proportion of people who are finding it really tough. My own brother is living on his own, not in this country, but he's fine. He's lonely. He's finding it tough and he's doing his best and he's being brave, but it's very, very tough. For him. You've got people, maybe we saw the rise in domestic violence. There's people living in awful conditions, mm -hmm. relationships that are going bad. So, so how do you, how do you, cope with this well first first of all thank god for brilliant brilliant scientists like luke i mean just the world owes them because they're not you know they're they, they do this for the love of what they're doing for the sheer curiosity science is a noble enterprise and um the, the, how they have managed in unprecedentedly short time to come up with not one but several effective vaccines it's just amazing so we have to think imagine you were in 1940 europe in ireland or in britain imagine the bleakness the blackness the world is falling to pieces there's no you're, you're, you're no ordinary you can't eat anything it's awful and there's no prospect inside yeah people got through it we've Thanks to Luke and people like him, we've got a big bright light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, mm. the tunnel might be a few months away, but that, that should be the big beacon of hope. Yeah, mm. we will get out of this. And remember, once we're out of it, once we're at Luke's concert, we will look back and say, God, was that a year and a half? Because time collapses yeah. in retrospect yeah. and it expands in the future. And so there's this weirdness with time. And we will look back and say, God, that, didn't, that year and a half just went like that. So, so is, is yeah. there a method in the madness then in holding on to that pint at the bar in the George and going down to Rings End Dump? Abs is, is... Absolutely. I yeah. mean, I, I, mean I, I just love going to Italy and just the thought, you know, I sometimes... Get, get, almost get shaky legs at the thought of being, you know, have, sitting in a you know a bar in the beside the sea in Italy. You know, oh, just you know. And yes, by all means, hold on to these things. Mm. But the main thing about how to cope with stress, you're feeling, oh, another bloody Tuesday, as Luke was saying. You're maybe living your own in the centre of town or something. Like, another walk. Why am I going out for a walk? It's so so tough when you're on your own, particularly. So what I'd say to you, this is um, actually stress in moderate levels. And we are talking about moderate levels of stress here. We're not talking about, we're not in a civil war in Syria. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're talking about moderate levels of stress. And if you approach moderate levels of stress mentally in the right way, then they act like a kind of vaccination. They strengthen you. And uh, the evidence is quite powerful that, particularly in younger life, adversity, moderate levels of adversity emotionally toughen people and they also physically toughen people 
They make them more able to cope with pain, for instance. So the, the, the big, I think the big kind of cha mental challenge for us when we're feeling stressed and, and there's these months lying ahead of us is to take pride, is to set a challenge for ourselves in getting in a kind of grim satisfaction at getting through this tough time. Mm. Because that mastering adversity is the biggest mm. source of confidence. Yeah. Self-confidence. And self-confidence is the most valuable resource a person or a group or a family or a company or a country can have. And mastering adversity. So to see this as a form of stress, yes, I don't like it. But actually, I'm learning about myself here. And I'm going to, here's a challenge, rather than a threat making me feel miserable. Let me embrace this as a challenge mm. to see what I can make of this. And that requires creativity. Mm. Rather than be bored with the same walk you've done every day. Yeah, yeah. Let's be creative with this. Let me see, what, what possibly could I do that would actually... When I come back and say, oh, that was, that was actually quite interesting, even if it's changing the route of your walk, even yeah. if it's talking to someone on the walk. Yeah. So that combination of setting a challenge for yourself, seeing the stress as a, a vaccination that makes you in the short term feel bad, the way some vaccinations do, but in the long term protects you and strengthens you. That's absolutely psychologically and physiologically true. Yeah. So that's my, certainly feel that myself when I've been through tough times and it really helps. It's a certain detachment from the emotions, a certain looking at yourself and saying, well, can you do this? Yeah, yeah I can. Yeah, I can. That's beautiful. Stress is a vaccination. I really love that. I'm actually going to come back to this in a few minutes if you, if, if you don't mind, because I, I do want to go a bit more into what's going on in the brain when we strive uh, for purpose, for hope, when we when we strive to be creative and and, and try to to do that, but I think a lot of people, um, when we think about that end goal, whether it's the point in in the George, whether it's that you know uh, concert with the psychedelics and the metabolics, what whatever it's going to be, um, the vaccine is is the big source of hope. And and to to Ian's point a moment ago the daily innovations that even people that don't even understand what they are are seeing coming out in the press um, are is, is magnificent. And so so two questions for you, Luke. Um, how much uh, can you tell us a bit more about the vaccine, why it should be a source of hope, why science should be a source of hope for us specifically? Yeah. And also, the one thing and actually we've had a couple of questions come through on it is the, the sort of toxic clickbait media approach to sensationalist head headlines, which tend to drag us down. Now, I personally ignore, walk away, filter out. Um, but as we're going towards that and as we're seeking that hope, the, the, the role of the media um, yeah. and that, they're, that they're playing. And I'd love to hear some more about uh, from you about that, if that's OK. I'd be careful where you get your information. Let's start with that, Paula, because, I mean, now, I'm not knocking NEFA, but they've got one way of looking at the world, you know, and they, what they say is based on their best advice to the government, you know, and you can listen to that a bit, you see, but, but it is, now, not going to blow me on trumpet, but listen to people like me, you know, because you know, as Ian yeah. said, we're objective and we're independent and, and, and you will see a mix of opinions from the immunologists and I'm inclined to be glass half full, listen to Kingston as well, he's a bit more glass half empty, that makes a killer combination, by the way, because you need a bit of realism as well, you know. But just just be careful where you get your news from. And now, the, uh, to be honest, the RT news is good overall. And so, is, you know, the main newspapers and I we're blessed in Ireland, actually, overall, we're quite a good media, I would say, less sensationalist and so on. And then the trouble is when politics gets, gets mixed up with science, that's always bad. Avoid that like the plague, you know, because that's mm -hmm. terrible. And we can see in Ireland, for instance, I mean, it's a it's a bit of a tragedy. We can't get one island on this issue, isn't it? You know, but so don't don't dwell on that at all. And then remember, um. I can give it to you in, in, in two or three quick sentences. And Ian has said it, that the, the world of science went from the first description of this virus this time last year, roughly. Uh, it, was, it was the beginning of January, really. Within 11 months, there was a vaccine in someone's arm. That's remarkable. Yeah, incredible. And not only that, but that vaccine was 90% efficacious. It broke all the records for efficacy with the vaccine. So that was tremendous as well. 
And then, and that was a big relief for me personally and all of us immunologists. There was a chance it could have been like two years away. There were, mm -hmm. there were several unknowns here. The great phrase that was used a lot by Tony Fauci, who's our, our big immunology hero, was cautious optimism, you know. So we, mm -hmm. we were optimistic. We weren't quite sure, you see. And then right before Christmas then, before the end, you had three vaccines. And now, we, as Ian says, we, we have as many as nine, actually, yeah. which are all showing remarkable efficacy. Now, mm -hmm. for crying out loud, to, to use an unfortunate, going back to World War II, as Ian said, we've got the two atom bombs now to end this war. Let's put it that way. You know, and I know it's a horrible thing to compare to in a sense, but, but in other words, we now have the best weapons we could ever configure to beat this virus. Because if you vaccine, let's say your mother or your father is in a nursing home mm -hmm. and you give them that Pfizer vaccine, you will decrease their risk of catching this disease and getting sick and ending up in hospital by 90, 95%. That's remarkable. Yeah. And in fact, all the main vaccines now massively decrease the risk of illness, hospitalization and death. And one of them, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, 49 days after you've had the shot, you have a zero risk of dying or ending up in hospital or getting sick. That vaccine is so powerful. So, so there, there, there's the really good news. Now, now the next challenge, it moves on. So, I mean, I've been saying lately, about it. science has done its job now. There's the vaccine. So now you've got to get it out, haven't you? And it's all the logistics and all the bickering last weekend was most unfortunate with the EU and all this sort of stuff. Now we're all watching that and our, our jaws are dropping a bit. But I wouldn't worry too much about that because they will sort that out. Mm. I have no doubt at all there will be 1.7 billion doses of vaccines available for the EU probably by May, June time. We'll get our share of that, you know. So it's just a process. It will stumble a bit and you got to get ready for that as well. It's always be realistic. You will see the odd slip up. The mm. factory breaks down or some government gets in ahead of you and gets more vaccine than you, you know. Mm. But the imperative now is, 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 is crystal clear to get these vaccines into people's arms. And then the other good part of the story is and Israel is the, is the great country to watch because they've now vaccinated half their people. They're not getting data. Yesterday, the vaccine's working for definite. There was a 36% decrease in transmit um, uh, of um, hospitalizations after the first shot of the Pfizer vaccine. But there you have the evidence now that mm -hmm. it's working, you know. And again, that's great to see because that'll come that, that that level of efficacy will come here as well. And I'm watching that every day. So every morning when I wake up, I know it's obsessive now. Now, by the way, Paul, avoid the doom scrolling. That's the other great thing we're all saying, isn't it? Just scrolling endlessly. Yeah. But every day I've got my Twitter feed and I get like four or five pings, new news on vaccines every single day. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, the last few days, it's all been positive. You know, now mm. there are concerns. It's not a slam dunk yet. Always be ready for that. Just and I think it's very important to be open to people <laughs> say, look, it's a journey. We're on a scientific journey as well. But by God, so far, so good. And, and if there are one or two slips, it won't matter in the long run, you know. Mm. Well, I think it's one of those unique points in, in human history where there's nobody on the planet has a vested interest in slowing this down. There's no economic, yeah. political or financial vested interest to slow this down. That's so by right. the law of averages, it will happen as quickly as it possibly and, can. And, and the other fact that's very important for our discussion tonight, but is, and this began, we all knew this back in March, this virus has touched every single aspect of your life, you know, yeah. Yeah. from birth to death. Funerals. Let's look at those for a minute. You know, babies being born without the father allowed in the room. You know, yep, weddings yep. with limited people, holidays, yep. schools, universities, and that's not just the health questions. You know, I mean, it's yep. it's no wonder people are up to high dose. Probably. And, and getting back to your the start of this this uh, which I asked Ian just a minute ago. But don't worry. It's a very very difficult time. Mm. If you're suffering, that's perfectly justifiable, you know, because, mm. because we're going through a very difficult time as a, as a, mm. as a country, as a, all of us individually, as families. So mm. any little win is a big win. Yeah. If you manage to go for the walk that you didn't fancy going on, count that as a win. You know, mm. I mean, just going to the shop for someone is a trauma now because they're so stressed about catching it and they don't, all that kind of thing. Yeah, 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 just yeah. going out and buying a bottle of milk is a win, mm. you know. And, and even though you don't want to make that phone call to a long lost friend, make it. And even if it doesn't go great, it's still a win, you know? So, so yeah. I think little things are really important at, at this phase. And then as Ian was saying, can you imagine how we'd all feel, Paula, when we come out the other end of it and feel we somehow managed to get through? It mightn't be perfect. You might've made mistakes. You might've slipped up here and there with relationships, whatever it is. But imagine you can look back and go, good God, I went through the most traumatic thing in my life. And in fact, I think what's happening as well, that strikes me uh, with our students, and I've got two kids myself, and. They will never, ever forget this period in their lives mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. Their lives will be split pre and post pandemic, 
when they're grandparents, they'll be boring their grandchildren. Do you know what happened to me in 2021? That's how serious this is for people. Yeah. Yeah. So we we were talking about this earlier before we went live, the kind of, uh, you know, we've been a highly successful species for thousands of years. We've survived because of of our adaptive mechanisms and we've been through very severe periods in human history. Um, and you've both talked a lot about the, the small things being the big things and, and the, the big things, you know, in terms of in terms of where we've headed. Ian, could you talk to us a little bit more about that, those innate coping mechanisms that we have, that innate resilience that we have? And, and then I might just lead us on to both of you just talking about what actually happens in the brain when you're hopeful when you strive for something. And I want to end that with a, la- a really deadly question that somebody just sent in, which is, can you learn hope or are you born with it? Mm-hmm. Um, so can you just talk to us about your innate, our, our innate coping mechanisms as a species, how we can tap into them and what's actually going on in the brain when we strive and we seek hope and we seek purpose? So um, most people are slightly deluded. <laughs> So if you ask them to estimate probabilities of winning a roll of the dice or the probabilities of getting a certain disease or of, of, we'll look at the lottery, of winning the lottery, we're, we're, we're over optimistic on average than we should be statistic, given the raw basic statistics of life. Mm. And that's the, that's 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 a, a healthy, slight overconfidence and slight over optimism about the world mm-hmm. and the future. Which, if you're depressed, you tend not to have, uh, and maybe chronic pessimists, very severe chronic pessimists, may not have. But most people, what gets them up in the morning is the is this of slightly deluded over optimism mm. and the, the wonderful thing about this quality of human beings who allows them to pick themselves up after the most grim circumstances mm. and you see it in really people brought up in really tough parts of the world and really adverse circumstances that ability of so it's a critical part of the human spirit is that ability to project forward and imagine an outcome that doesn't yet exist in the world and is not not even necessarily justified by what you can see around you. Mm. And that's that's really, that's that's confidence. That's an optimism is bound in with with confidence as is hope. And um, what it does to the brain is what what that this kind of hope confident anticipation of something in the future does is it switches on the brain's reward network in the part of the brain called the ventral striatum you get this increase in dopamine activity a bit like i get when i imagine myself sitting in that bar in the side of the sea by italy that kind of shaky legs i get is my reward network firing up in anticipation of a reward that hasn't yet come. Mm -hmm. And so hope for the future, confident hope for the future does that. And the secret of this is it acts like a mini antidepressant. That Mm -hmm. increased dopamine activity lifts your mood and also decreases your anxiety. So it's like this amazing, amazing pair of your set of pharmaceuticals that you could administer yourself by sometimes making a conscious decision to yeah. project forward and say, I will do this. I will come through this. And that, that actually is uh, at, the, at the root of most human achievements, human success, human civilization, is that capacity to imagine a future that doesn't yet exist. Mm. And be motivated and motivatedly work towards it, uh, and we can see it. We can see it acting out in in the, in the brain and other circuits as well in the brain. So we've got the kit to do this. We have the kit to do it, and we have done it. If you think of 
awful things that people have come through mm. and, yeah. and the awful times in our history. I mean, think of Ireland. Yeah. Awful economic circumstances Ireland was in for 50, 40 years through the whole 30s and 40s and 50s until TK Whitaker came along and, and the, you know, the, slowly the economy started to build. I mean, life was tough and grim, but people, and a lot of people suffered and a lot of people emigrated. We've heard about a lot of the suffering that went on then, but people got through it. Mm. And it was that human spirit, that human confidence, that optimism, that slight delude, this slightly deluded perspective on the future but the thing is with with science now and technology you don't the delusion is actually probably an underestimate of what we can do mm. <laughs> because technological and scientific change is actually exponential the problems we face are potentially much more soluble solvable than they were even 10 years ago or 20 years ago, as we've seen with the vaccine now. Yeah, yeah. So that means actually we're totally justified in being slightly deluded about the future. <laughs> but we just, we just have to harness this. We have to harness this technological change. We have to harness the science. We have to organize, organize ourselves. We have to fight off the, 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 the conspiracy theories, fight off the anti-vax, the anti-science. We have to build rationality create, you know, foster rationality, foster decency and equity. Mm. And if we do that, I mean, the world really is our oyster. We will get through this and worse. Justifiable delusion. I love that. I'm going to use that as my excuse when I'm told I have notions in the future. <laughs> um, I We're being inundated with questions here and I, I don't want to ignore them. Um, so I'm going to go slightly off. I've got loads more questions I want to to talk to you about, but I do want to try and answer some of these questions because people are really engaging here and you're getting high fives from an awful lot of people there if you if, if you can't see them. Um, and in fact, you've both been invited for a pint um, um, <laughs> in the summer because apparently, Luke, you recently promised that we'd all be sitting in beer gardens. I and, did. I and did. This, this <laughs> oh, particular oh. man wants to know where both of your favourite pub is and can he buy you a <laughs> pint to say thank you? Um, <laughs> Yeah. Say yes, and we'll get his details for you. Okay. Um, so here's one question for you. Um, tips on supporting adult children. Uh, they're seeing no friends and partners, and they're witnessing their heads go down. And it's hard to get them just to engage with the exercise and the routine, just the starting point, that first jump. Mm. What, what advice would, would you both give to, to that lady? Well, ha having two adult children myself, I can have a go at that one, Paula. Yeah, I know, you I know Ian has as well, but um, it's very tough for them. Getting back to the, I know we keep saying it's very tough for them. And I, I worry a lot about that, that age group, actually, because they're arrested development of ever there's a case in point. Because if you're 18, 19, 20, 21, right? You're meant to be getting out, meant to be meeting friends, yeah, meant to be getting your peer group, meant to be getting your identity sorted. You know, what, what, what sort of person are you going to become kind of thing, you know? And then you're meant to try and meet a partner as well. All that stuff's going on mm -hmm. then, you know? And I feel very sorry for people in third level because they can't do that, you know? Now, now what can we do to help them? Well, again, we, we, we support them as best we can, actually. I think that's the first thing we would all agree with. And that's a good way to get out of yourself anyway, to think about them more than your own concerns. I know that can be difficult for some people, but that kind of thing, you know, cut them loads of slack, tell you that much. Don't kick them off the screens for the moment, you know, mm. and just encourage them to take a bit of exercise. I mean, the other thing to say, by the way, Father, which, which, which I always say, regularly in the media is you, you you're not hopeless in the face of this virus you can help your own immune system by doing certain things to protect you from the virus and we know an awful lot about how to make our immune systems healthy and it's obvious stuff mm -hmm. um the immune system like every other part of your body likes a bit of exercise it likes a good diet you know and one thing it really likes is social activity actually and, and the main reason for that is stress is a massive negative on the immune system. It, it causes immunosuppression. And we all know this. If you have a stress in your life, you're more at risk of a cold and a flu. So, so you've got to think, how am I going to de-stress? And that mm. age group in particular, a bit of what they fancy. Let them watch that movie. Let them 
you know, now it's possible to meet friends is essential. They can do it online for the moment. They can go for a walk with a friend. That's, tragically, this is what makes level five so awful. They, they can't mm. visit each other's houses, can they? But certainly try to maintain their social contacts as best they can. Yeah. And just tell them again, the mantra, this will pass and, and you will come out and, and you'll be blinking in the sunshine mm. and you will continue your life, you know, it, it, and it will begin in the summer. And, and when I, when I was at, I was, um, and I stood up for that question, Father. So, um, it was Jen O'Connell said that to me. She said, uh, Luke, when do you think we'll be in a beer garden again? And I happened to say, uh, June. And the headline was, O'Neill says we'll be in a beer garden. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't mind. I, I knew what she was doing there. It was fine. And that is an optimistic thing to say. Now, why did I say that? I said it because it, it, there's a really good chance it's outdoors. That's because if I remember, <laughs> when you step outdoors, you decrease your risk of infection 19 fold. That's a massive decrease risk already, you know, mm. beer garden. They'll probably have tables distanced, by the way. You may have a limit at the table, you know, mm. but, but they've got to begin. And, and, and the second thing I'd say about this, we have to be given some rewards for this period we're going through by, by the yeah. government. OK, and even a tiny reward like allowing beer garden to open under controlled circumstances that would give us all a lift, wouldn't it? Yeah. Now, the pubs aren't going to open. There's not going to be electric picnic, but little, little tiny things. And I predict that will happen. I'll tell you why, because the other good news is, right, we can model the impact the vaccination campaign will have. OK, and some very good UK scientists have done this and Israeli scientists. And there was a big thing in America in them, um, Science, one of the world's best science journals, big thing at the weekend. So we know that 75 percent of deaths are over 65. OK, mm -hmm. if you vaccinate that group and you decrease their risk 90 percent, that death rate begins to fall precipitously, mm -hmm. you see. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, less cases translates into less people in hospital, less ICU admissions. And now the hospital numbers begin to go. And we can predict that by the, if we get the 700,000, that's the magic number for us now. If we get the 700,000 vaccinated by the end of March, once we get to April, May time, that vaccine is doing its magic and those numbers are right down. The government have to begin to let us loose a little bit here and there. You know, mm -hmm. now it's very important we maintain things because lots of people aren't vaccinated. You know, we still don't fully know if the vaccine stops transmission, although good news today, AstraZeneca said their vaccine stops transmission 67 percent that's a great thing to hear so mm -hmm. that's getting better as well but we'd have to keep up with things probably for six months but little little, little i suppose a good example is we'll be given little treats here and there and mm -hmm. i'm sure ian would agree you can't be giving a human a treat now and again it helps them you know so so that kind of thing's going to be happening in the future okay is there anything that you'd add uh, to that uh, ian and i'm thinking specifically again about the, the very brief conversation we had before we, we came on um about anger uh, you mentioned anger and I'm thinking of that specifically in relation to uh, teenagers and, and younger adults who perhaps feel a little angry that they're being robbed of their golden years, they're yeah. being robbed of key milestones mm -hmm. and particularly those studying for the Leaving Cert. There's quite a lot of questions coming through around, you know, uh, younger people studying for the Leaving Cert, they're held in limbo, uh, etc. What, what would your perspective be there? What, would your, what, what thoughts would you share with people on that? Yeah, so the adult children question actually maps onto this because one of the one of the it's very difficult for a parent to say to an adult child, "Oh, go out for a run." There's a tendency for yeah. to, to you know be annoyed, understandably. But um, but there are there are a number of amazing online things you can play with, you know, poker, online poker. I mean, it's amazing what's out there. If you, if you, sorry, if can you, I just say, Luke, you're going yeah. to have the competitive headline tomorrow. Professor Ian <laughs> Robertson advocates gambling in yeah, Ireland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Luke O'Neill advocates the points. Oh, Ian, you know, Ian, gambling. Ian, Ian should have been a bookmaker because he knows absolutely. people are optimistic about winning. Yeah, forget the psychedelics. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, but maybe the online poker. <laughs> we were very small stakes. It was. I think it was five euro ahead we were in for. So let's let put that. <laughs> um, but anger is such an interesting thing because our emotions divide basically into emotions of approach and emotions of avoidance. And emotions of approach include excitement, uh, joy, love, um, and emotions of avoidance involve anxiety. Uh, depression, uh, f you know, fear, mm -hmm. and these are two basic. These are wired in our brain. They're two basic uh, 
kind of competing uh, approach and avoidance. They used to think anger was one of the negative avoidance emotions, but it's not. It's one of the approach emotions, which makes it a complicated and interesting emotion. And there's two quotes about anger. You know, I, I just uh, one is uh, Mark Twain, um, who says uh, anger is an acid that can do more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than to anything on which it is poured. Fantastic. And contrast that to Maya Angelou, the great Maya Angelou. She says, bitterness is like cancer. It eats upon the host. But anger is like fire. It burns it all clean. So here's the question. Which, which, of, these, which of these is right, Maya Angelou or Mark Twain? And the answer, the answer is they're both, both right. Okay. And um, Socrates had, had, the, had the answer. Uh, because Socrates says um, uh, anybody can become, sorry, it was Art Aristotle, not Socrates, anybody can become angry. That is easy. But to be angry with the right person and to the right degree and at the right time and mm -hmm. for the right purpose and in the right way, that is not within everybody's power and it is not easy. So anger is only uh, a positive emotion if it follows Ar Aristotle's prescription, because anger is actually, all emotions serve an evolutionary purpose. And anger's purpose is as an, essentially a negotiation tool. It's a way of negotiating to get your way vis-a-vis -vis another human being, okay? And angers are mainly displays that, that, that make it more likely that you will get your way. Mm. But if it's not against a specific person or target with a specific request, yeah. and done in a way that's likely to get that request, then it turns inward and becomes an acid, a bitterness, a cancer that eats on the host. Because so there's that, no channel or target for there's it. There's no target. Yeah. So that's why non-specific anger, because the symptoms of it, the sympathetic autonomic nervous system is activated, churning stomach, sweaty hands, fast breathing, rapid pulse, these are exactly the same emotions for anxiety as they are for anger. Mm -hmm. So non-specific Mark Twain type anger easily, usually in fact, becomes merged with ang anxiety. And so when you're anxious, it makes you angry. And when you're angry, it makes you anxious. And that really drags people down. So that's why Lust for Life, your focus on activism and getting young people to do stuff. And this is also partly an answer about the adult, young adult children, mm. is getting them doing stuff, preferably on behalf of not just themselves, but mm. of, of other people that they feel mm. are having a tough time and having a specific target and a specific group or person as that target. And that is energizing, that turns anger into a, a healing and mm. in, empowering uh, approach emotion that activates the brain's reward network and acts as an antidepressant as well. So if you're witnessing that non-specific anger, either in yourself or in your adult child, your teenager, your, your partner, whoever that may be, what's the first step to take that in that constructive direction? Um, it's to say, uh, what, what is it that's making you angry? What is it you want changed? Okay, yeah. How could you get that? Is it feasible to change that? Mm. If not, is there something else that you can you could aim to change? Mm. How are you going to do that? Because mm. imp impotent anger is just it's ghastly. You know, mm. scrolling the web and you know feeding your anger and 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 you know wasting your time. It's a kind of onanistic activity so so it's a question of saying okay you're angry what are you going to do about it <laughs> and then uh, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, yeah yeah that's fantastic that's fascinating actually that's fascinating because i don't think most people make that delineation i think angry typically falls into the bad bucket and something to be avoided but that's 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 actually really helpful and i think probably very helpful for people living in quite cocooned environments with quite intense emotions within themselves yeah. or with those around them. Yeah. Um, 
I, I'm going to ask a, a really flippant question, but I, I think it's a relevant one. And I'm going to give it back to you, Luke. What advice would you give to people dating during the pandemic? Now, what the hell makes you think I'd know the answer to that? I haven't dated in years. I just thought it was your turn to talk, Luke, and I thought, you know, you, no, and I, you know, we'll get another headline out of it as, was basically my logic, you know. Well, well, no more than Ian, we were in an age when dating was very gallant, wasn't it? There was none of this uh, Tinder and right, all these things, you know, that's online. More is a pity. Um, well, I'll have a go if you like, Paul, on that one. But well, it's extremely important, isn't it? Let's face it. it. I mean, as I yeah. said earlier, I mean, talk about we're, we're talking about how the brain is is set up in a certain way, evolutionarily. You mm -hmm. need to get a partner, and 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 that's there's an imperative on human beings there, you know. And some people, some people do, some people don't. And I'm not saying it's essential, you know. Some people are, sometimes don't find the right part that they still lead full, fully fulfilled lives, you see. But certainly, mm -hmm. when you're in that age, beginning of puberty, on. You've got one mission in some ways, you know, partly mm -hmm. to make sure the species continues. I know it sounds very <laughs> clinical, but it's true, you know. So you've got so people who are in that position have to get somehow be be able to do it. I don't know. I don't know. You know, it's hard to do, isn't it? I'm sure there's lots of ways to do it online, as, as we're just mentioning. But just try to do what you can. I'll tell you that much. Well, and, and then again, no more than that. Else, Paul, as I look to the future, because there's going to be a lot of action happening when we all come out. <laughs> <of that. laughs> <laughs> there you go. There's a good source of hope. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, somebody's you just might suggesting... get lucky. There's a great phrase. Everybody's going to get lucky. That everybody's going to get that. lucky. There you go. There's your banner of hope. Um, somebody's just suggested that Luke could set up a scientific, um, a scientific Tinder. If you're getting, yeah. <laughs> you've got the psychedelics, and you've got you've got you've got psych, psych, scientific Tinder. Yeah. Um, another question that's come in, and it's coming in a, f a few different forms here. So I'll just use one one phrase of it, and I'm going to ask you both to answer this actually. Um, and I'll start with you, Ian. How will the world change when this is over? Will it change? Um, human human behavior is hugely shaped by the environment. And, you know, we know from sometimes just small changes in policy or, you know, circumstances can cause huge shifts in human behavior. So I, I think what this will do will have, it will, for some, it will change some people's lives fundamentally. Mm -hmm. But it won't change most people's lives fundamentally. Um, one of the risks is uh, that there's evidence that um, young people who grow up in that critical 18 to 23 age group we've been talking about, people who come of age, come into that age group during a recession, end up a bit less confident mm. than those who come of age in good times, economic good times. And there was a survey done over in the UK where uh, of, of that kind of age group, of teenagers, late teenagers, and about 40% of them felt that they could never realize their, 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 what they had foreseen in their lives for themselves. It was a horrible, horrible statistic. So there's the, the biggest, I think Luke was right, that it is that age group, that critical time in life, that we have to be really, really careful to nurture and to help make sure they don't suffer that unnecessary depletion of their confidence in their mm. own futures. Mm. Um, and we have to, that's why your charity is so important. That's why we all have to work at that. And that's why Luke's ideas of a kind of VA, VE eight day it. celebrations is just masterful. It is absolutely brilliant. I mean, screw the festival of Brexit. Let's have a, a festival. <laughs> I don't think there were many people going to that one anyway, <laughs> in fairness. <laughs> what, what about what about you, Lee? What would you say about how the world will change when this is Well, an, another rather disturbing fact is this. I mean, the notion of the schools being closed is disastrous, remember, Paula, because there's lots of studies in previous pandemics in Africa, mainly, where they closed schools. 
those kids suffered for years and years yeah. after that. They, 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 there's really good studies on this. Like Ebola was a big pandemic and they would have closed schools for five or six months in those countries. Mm. Even 15 years later, they see the scars on those kids mm. because yeah. they're out of their environment. They're not learning all these things. They get demotivated. So, so, so the future has to be very carefully thought about. Yeah. And I do think we need, when we come out of this, there will be a huge mental health crisis. There has to be. There has to be all kinds of consequences that we didn't anticipate, or, or at least we would we can't anticipate. We're not sure how bad it's going to be, mm. and we've got to get ready for that. I think, and, and certainly there has to be a massive. Now, this, you'll see people saying this, not just me, obviously, a big investment in this because because there will be difficulties as we come out. Because as Ian has said, the vast majority will be okay, but there will be a significant percent of people who who will who will struggle for all kinds of reasons. So so what that might mean is a, a greater appreciation of mental health and and in fact the supports that people need anyway because often in a, in an emergency you know never waste a crisis is the famous phrase. Yeah, yeah. And who knows we might get more investment and more consideration for this. And not only that but in public health as well that and you've been hearing that for the last Ireland has the least served in your European country in public health it's ridiculous yeah, you know. Yeah, so again yeah. that might change but but I think more more specifically for me as a scientist um all this work that's going on. I mean, I'm, I'm, there's something like 120,000 separate publications about COVID-19 now in, in the scientific literature. Can you believe it? Each one is a nugget of information, okay? Now, we will beat COVID, but the truth is we learn about the immune system. We learn about other diseases. They could be mm -hmm. things like sepsis. Um, I mean, people have probably realized by now that the, um, the this mm -hmm. disease, inflammatory in your lungs get very inflamed, you know? Some mm -hmm. of the drugs for arthritis are being used for COVID and they're working a bit, you know, but mm -hmm. we're learning more and more about inflammation. That could be applied to colitis. It could be applied to Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. So there's going to be many spin outs coming from this research. And most compellingly of all, mm -hmm. as we again, everybody's an expert, these RNA, so-called RNA vaccines. That was a mm -hmm. brand new technology, never before used in humans, approved in humans. And it's working gangbusters. I saw an analysis about a week ago from the biotech sort of a consultancy service, whatever you want to call it, saying that the number one thing in industry will be now vaccines because they're going to start vaccinating against lots of things. Mm. And vaccines was always the correlation in drug companies. They, they couldn't make much money out of them. You mm. know, it was sort of a, a low hanging fruit thing. Now you're going to see a ramp up of the vaccination campaign. And I'm talking about malaria, HIV. There's already attempts now to, to soup up those from what we're learning from COVID. And then most of all, cancer, interestingly, because that RNA vaccine technology that BioNTech had who, who with Pfizer, they were actually in the cancer business, not, not, not really infectious diseases. So they, they were shooting RNA vaccines at tumors initially, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're going to see a lot of medical advances in the future on the back of all this great research. It's a bit like the moonshot gave rise to coating for your your frying pan in your kitchen yeah, or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. It's that kind yeah. of thing. You know, you, so, uh, science is very adaptable. Science will always look for answers and apply things in different contexts. We're very ingenious as a species, you mm -hmm. see. So yeah. I've no doubt that all this fantastic research will yield dividends well beyond COVID. And what about, and, and I'm just a bit conscious of time actually, because we've only got a few minutes left. If you're okay to run over by just a couple of minutes. Yeah. Um, there's one interesting question that's just come in uh, in relation to this post uh, this post COVID world, which we yeah. all we all yearn for, um, so clearly from what you've said, Luke, there's there's great reason to be hopeful, not just about how it will come, but also actually all of the innovations and benefits that we're going to realise yeah. as a result of what we've lived through. Yeah. Um, this is not unrelated to the conversation we were having earlier about you know some of us starting to feel a little bit institutionalised after the last year and. You know, I was saying I've become very in touch with my inner introvert, having been an extreme extrovert all my life. Um, but there's a couple of questions just coming in here on. Um, I'm nervous about life after COVID. And you've almost got that image of an animal coming out of a cave and blinking at the light, having been in the darkness for a long period of time. What would Ian, what would you say to, to, to somebody that's 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 looking ahead to that? Is, is there I, 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 is I, I, a perspective I, we should be having on that? I, I know I know I know what that person means because when I think I used to travel far too much when I think about oh god you know flying to America it's kind of ooh so anything you know any unfamiliar doing unfamiliar things can cause a little bit of anxiety all I would say is this one of the very best antidotes to low motivation and anxiety is to do stuff 
chronically mm -hmm. anxious people do less stuff. And because they do less stuff, they end up getting fewer chance reinforcements, meetings, relationships, um, chance, chance observations. So doing stuff, taking that step forward, even though you don't feel like it, mm. works because often our emotions follow our behavior as much as vice versa. So I would just say, just even though you're scared of the prospect of going out or getting mm. back to normal life, just do it yeah. in a gradual way, gradually mm. extend yourself and you'll be fine. I've got some advice, Paul, on this one. So um, my dad, who was quite wise, I must say, I hate to give him credit, but uh, remember you remember you were like 12 or 13 and you were going back to school. You dreaded that Monday morning, didn't you? Yeah. And I wanted to go back to school, but I was still anxious about it. My dad would go, sure, within a day, you won't even remember your holiday, but you'll be back in action again. And he, he encouraged me just to go in on that first day, you know? Yeah. And even yeah. though I wanted to go in, I was still very anxious about it, you know, as, yeah. as we all remember, remember the dreaded September, you yeah. know? And in fact, it is like your typical Monday morning. I mean, that, that's a fascination for me, Ian. The notion of why everybody finds Monday mornings tough, even though you love your job. It's because you're in a different environment and you've got to go into the environment again and it's a bit different from the Sunday weekend environment. And you're in on a Monday morning, by lunchtime, you're back to normal, you know? So, yeah, so, yeah. so there is that, um, you just, yeah. just do it, exactly. And take a baby step again. I, I think like, the key message overall, what struck me tonight, Paul, I, I mean, we, we didn't plan this in any way as a one-liner, but be, just be kind to yourself. I mean, that, that's the key message. And just take a tiny step when we begin to reopen. It mightn't work out for you the first time. You might still be, oh God, I'm not going to that party, you know. Um, but just little tiny baby steps is, is the secret mm. in the end. And we, and we all feel the same anyway. Remember, I love yeah. that notion as well, Paul, that we're all in this together. We're all, we're all going through the same things, really. Yeah. And even though, mm. even though, as I said earlier, I'm, 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 I'm doing well in the sense that I'm so busy and all the rest, but I still have a tough day now and again. We're, we're, all, we're all in the same journey in a sense, yeah. you know? And, and one last thing on this point, uh, on our previous point, which I meant to say for you, see so how things are changing. And it's slightly off this question, but I, in case I forget it, you, you know what's happened with the vaccine business? So Pfizer have the vaccine, Novartis and Sanofi, two rival companies have given over their factories to make the Pfizer vaccine. That's unprecedented in the pharmaceutical sector. It's a bit like Pepsi agreeing to make Coke for a while. It's as big as that, you know? So, so there we see, I think you're going to see a lot more collaboration, a lot more heads together to crack the big problems. Um, and, and, and that'll be part of our future as well, I would say. Yeah. And we might, we might face up to climate change a bit more readily yeah. now because we yeah. trust science more. We do. Exactly. The, threat, exactly. the threat is more visible to us. Yeah, that's yep. fabulous. I'm actually thinking back there, Luke, as you were talking to um, uh, what my mother, who's actually on the call, Pauline, um, uh, when, she used to, when I, she used to be sending me back to school and I didn't want to go, even though I was a SWAT. Yeah. And it was always, um, well, you don't have to go if you don't want to, but I'd be very disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the woman Did you ever write a book, Paula, called The Irish Mother's 20 Best Phrases? You know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. I think my mother wrote it, Luke. I think my mother wrote it. So I think we're going to have to, to wrap up in a few minutes. I'm very conscious it's late and, and I have absolutely loved talking to both of you. Um, and I genuinely meant it at the, at the beginning. I'm not blowing hot air. What you've both done to step up for the country in the last year you have brought hope into people's hearts and I hope you get a lot of purpose from that because people really do need it um, and you've done it in such a human way. I mean, I was reading the names of some of your research papers earlier. I couldn't even pronounce them and I'm not poorly educated. But the way you talk, you talk from the heart and it's, it's just phenomenal. Um, you have two options for closing off here. One is that I just ask you to leave what you're biggest closing thought would be to everybody on the call the second is a suggestion from one of the attendees is that you do a duet <laughs> and it's entirely up to you both which one you um, which one you oh, we couldn't do it we're not we're not rehearsed we can't we can't do that we can't do the we duet we can, do two, we can do two solos we've got time luke that's that's we fine. have professional standards you know paul we can't possibly <laughs> you know challenge our, our our ego in that way you know? we need beer don't we luke we need beer <laughs> oh yeah by the way yeah ian was pissed when he signed the last song. <laughs> well if you won't sing would you would you give us one closing thought each 
Um, yeah. Ian. Go for it, Ian. Life is beautiful. Human consciousness is the most inexplicable and amazing phenomenon in the universe. And what a shame if we can't just enjoy it and be amazed by it. Wonderful. I'd still like to hear you sing, but that was that was nearly as good. That Jeez, I can't good. follow that. He's getting all <laughs> zen. <laughs> <then>. He's, <laughs> they shouldn't have let him go first. They shouldn't have let him go first. It's always a mistake. I, I would Thank leave everybody with, with what we've been saying again, I suppose. And it's very simple in a sense. Just be kind to yourself. Yeah. that's the key message actually because it's very tough at the moment and some people are very are suffering as everybody's suffering but some are really suffering yeah. just be kind um try and keep up with the science because that will give you the hope you need actually because as i've been saying to you there's tremendous people there's tens of thousands of people out there in the scientific world working on your behalf to try and crack this one and we've se we're seeing great successes already so remind yourself there's all those people rooting for you you know trying to make a difference and try to try, try to beat this damn virus and get us into a better place so keep reminding yourself of that as well i would say and as we've been saying paul it picks something to look forward to now that's so important and it could be that pint in the beer garden that glass of cider perhaps in the beer garden it could be visiting a relation in in, in a different country that you haven't seen it could be a, a, a relation coming back to ireland to see you whatever it might be it will happen you know mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think it's unreasonable for us to imagine what June would be like and then beyond in, into Christmas for definite. I know it seems like a long way off, mm. but I've no doubt the Christmas we're going to get this year. It, it, it may not be like it was before COVID, but it's going to be a damn sight better than the Christmas we've had. I'll tell you that much. And that's something to look forward to as well. I would say. To look forward to. And I won't have my tracksuit bottoms dragging me down. So I'm looking forward <laughs> to it. A um, lot of questions about whether this is being recorded. Yes, it is. And we will get it up on the website for anybody that wants to listen back or share it around. Luke, in really sincere thanks for the humour, the wisdom, the heart, for everything. And maybe we can get you back again um, to talk some more. And the next time, maybe you might rehearse an L song between the two of you so we can finish it the next time. <laughs> <laughs> huge huge thanks to both of you and thank you so much to everybody for joining and yeah. if you want to get in touch with us a lustforlife.com we'll be happy to come back to you thanks yeah just time. thank you paula wonderful charity look thank you so much it was such yeah. admiration for what you're doing it's amazing not at all and to, thanks and to all of you out there just hang in there you're just life's going to be fine just get through this you really will yep no, same for me. Thanks about your Paul. Thanks for asking. It was great. And thanks to everybody for the questions they're sending yeah. in. And thanks to you as well, Ian. I think uh, this could be our future with the new with the new Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I was terrified you. when I came on. I thought, what if we don't know about this big academic rivalry the two of them have? <laughs> and they start tearing lumps out of each other in the middle of the call. And then I thought, well, maybe that might be a bit of crack in itself. So, you know, we thought we'd go for it anyway. But yeah, yeah, when you get yeah. on, we'll ask you back again if that's all right. I know, I've lost. He's not only a rock singer, he's a much better scientist. Bugger me if he's not a better psychologist as well. Oh, no way. No, no, you see, there's false modesty, mate. Right, right, sorry, Professor Robertson, I beg your pardon. <laughs> Thanks very much. Enjoy. Great stuff. Thanks, guys. Thanks. All the best. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you.